This talk is on PID controllers. Uh, we're going to start with control algorithms and really present the co control system problem in general. And then we'll go on to a specific implementation, which is the PID controller, and talk about the three components and why we need each of them. Let's go. Okay, so what is a controller? A controller is any algorithm which generates a signal which is used by some system, which is known as the plant, to reach a specified value. So the input is usually from a user. So I've got this example of cruise control, in which case the user would set a speed, and the controller would be the electronics in the car, which generates a signal to the plant, which is the motor, and the motor generates the output, which is the car traveling at that speed, hopefully. Um, the idea of the plant, the separation between the plant and the controller is that we can set everything in the controller. We can set its parameters. We we're free to design it how we want. Uh, but the plant tends to be fixed, so it's like a motor or the car's engine. Um, and we make this separation so we can study the controller mathematically and apply it to different systems. Um, and in general, there's also going to be unmeasured input. So the car may be going up a hill. And we don't want the user to have to react to that hill and adjust their input accordingly. Hopefully, our controller is going to make its best estimate at keeping the car going as you told it to. Uh, some properties we want from control systems is to avoid lag. So if you say go at 70 miles an hour, it does it, and it doesn't do it tomorrow. Um, and to avoid overshoot, so you don't break the speed limit. And to reach a stable state, so you can't just oscillate. Even if you average at 70 miles an hour, it's not good enough to be going between 95 and 65. Um, so here's some control system examples. You've got quadcopters, which are actually three control systems, which will be roll, pitch, and yaw. And those work together to balance something that's quite complicated, which is just with four motors to try and get it to not zoom off in one direction. Um, or it might even have six controllers if it's a completely autonomous quadcopter and it's got to control uh, X, Y, and Z as well. And that's really why I'm interested in PID controllers, because my uh, little brother's built himself a quadcopter. And we thought that after we'd set everything up and everything, it would just start flying magically. But as soon as you put every, wired everything together, you um, put the throttle on it, it immediately turns over because you haven't set up the controller. Uh, so other examples are cruise control and segways. And all those are digital control systems. So the, what that means is you use a microprocessor or an FPGA to sample your system, your conditions, and sample your input, and then perform calculations in like a finite difference type of way. Um, they can also be analog, so early disk drive positioning, so the arm for your CD drive would actually use like a setup of capacitors and op amps and inductors and perform everything, perform all the calculations electronically, uh, but you'd still get this kind of loop that leads to the, p the position you want to be. And you can also think in the uh, body where the pancreas is sensing your blood sugar and it outputs a signal, which is some hormones, that tells the plant, which is your liver, uh, do we need to increase or decrease blood sugar? OK, so in general, in control theory, we classify controllers into two categories. They're either open or closed. Um, and in closed, it means you respond to feedback. And really, all good controllers will respond to feedback because uh, there's just no way that you can respond to these kind of unmeasured variables without looking, have we actually managed it? So I've got the example of, say, you were trying to control a door. You might, a, a, an open loop system would just say, turn for two seconds. Uh, but a closed loop system would say, turn until the door is closed. And you can imagine a situation where all of a sudden the carpet's really dirty, the door gets su stuck after two seconds and it's not closed. I mean, it does get more exciting, but... Uh, and I mentioned stability, but it's really important in these kind of feedback systems that oscillation doesn't become unbounded. So you can see in this graph of error over, t over time, 
that a naive person might look at that and say, look, we average at zero error. We're doing great. Uh, but if this was your door, it's not great. Um, and we've, we've seen from basically every lecture course this year the, this d terrible example of a bridge under wind that led to basically collapse just because they didn't consider the natural frequency and how it would respond to a certain set of conditions. Um, so just some things to keep in your mind that aren't really touched on too much in this talk, but it's not all mathematical. There's often other constraints that we want to consider, like the fact that we want to respond within a certain amount of time, so we can't just model everything and just put it into a really big computer and have it chug away and say, aha, this is the force you need to do. We often want to respond like real time. Um, and we can't put like infinite acceleration on something, even if we wanted to, because uh, our system says we want to do that. Um, so now we'll go on to the PID controller. So it's a closed loop negative feedback controller, which means that it takes the output and it will subtract it from your input. So say your input was 70 miles an hour. It takes the current speed, 65, and, and the signal is the error, which is the input to the controller, is 5 or minus 5, depending on how you set it up. Um, and it's actually three controllers. It's the P, the I, the D controller. And the output of the controller is the weighted sum of the three. And this goes into the plant and produces the output. Um, it's really popular. And it's really popular because it's only got three parameters, which is the weightings. Uh, and once you set those parameters, it often works really well in like a large variety of systems. Uh, and it's interesting because you can actually do it analog or digital. Because we'll come on to see what the components are of these, the P, the I, and the D parts, but they're all simple maths. And uh, the properties of op amps and uh, capacitors and inductors all kind of fit in to be able to actually do it either way. Um, so the three components are proportional, integral, and derivative. Um, so, and, and we're all talking with respect to error. So we're talking about proportional to the error, or the integral of the error, or the derivative of the error. Um, so this is a mathematical model. So the output, which is the signal that's given to the plant, so the signal that's given to the car, um, is this KP term, which is your weighting of the P controller times the error at that time, plus the KI term, which is the weighting of the integral term, plus the integral of error over all time, and then the KD term, which is the, the weighting of the derivative times the derivative. Um, so now we're going to go through each of the components and see why we need them. And we're going to start with the comp proportional component, which is, in my mind, the most simple. Uh, and I've got this example of trying to control a crane's winch. And if, if you were told, you, here, take this crane and lift up this pile of rods or something, uh, if you could control the speed, you would say, I want max speed at the beginning. And I'll gradually back off my speed until it reaches the point where I want it to be. So I've got zero speed exactly at the point where I want it to stop. Um, or that might be what, how you do it. Um, so you can imagine a, just a proportional controller here would work really well. Um, and by, you can actually, assuming there's no, no other inputs to the system, you could solve that differential equation and your error would reduce exponentially over time. And because you, your velocity is proportional to your error, uh, so would your velocity. Um, so now we need to think, why do we need the other two? Um, and this is mainly because we can't normally control just the first derivative of our error. Normally, we want to say, uh, if I wanted to walk over there, I could only control the force I put in, so the second derivative of my error. Um, and normally, there's these external forces, which means we can't just solve the uh, differential equation like we did on the last slide as simply. Um, so I've got this example of an astronaut with a jetpack that wants to try and achieve a height in space. Um, we're only talking in one dimension here. Um, so the astronaut can control their thrust, F, 
and they're trying to arrive at height y0. Uh, so their error is the difference between the two, the position. Uh, and they've got a force of gravity, which is always acting downwards on them, and an additional force, which is like a resistive force. Uh, and that's acting downwards or upwards, depending on whether they're... So if they're moving up, then the resistive force is acting to slow them down. Uh, and we're imagining that they can accelerate upwards as, as, and accelerate downwards. They haven't got this kind of implementation detail that they can actually only accelerate up, upwards. Um, and now if we imagine this system, if you just applied a proportional controller, um, you'd think it'd be great at the beginning because you're miles away, you apply like a really big throttle, and you gradually speed up, you approach where you want to be. But as you get to where you want to be, the whole time between you've moved between those two places, you've always been accelerating. So your speed's increased and increased and increased. And at the point that you arrive there, you have maximum speed. And so without any resistive force, you'd just fly straight through that position all the way up to the same distance again. Um, and then it would repeat and you'd oscillate. Um, luckily, with this resistive force, it'll gradually take energy out of the system and you will actually decay to being stably at uh, y0. Um, but then we've also got to consider that this gravitational force is always acting downwards. Um, so there'll be, there will be a point between mile, negative infinity and y0 where the distance between, so our error, times our proportional term, so that's a, that is our output, our thrust, is equal to the force of gravity. So that means that we'll actually end up in equilibrium somewhere around here, because that's where we're balancing off. So we'll see why we use the next two components to try and get rid of those two things. So we can introduce the integral component to get rid of that offset, where we're balancing gravity below where we want to be. Um, so here I've got two graphs, uh, one showing just a P controller, and one showing with P and I. And you can imagine, initially, the integral term is going to be quite small, because you're not integrating over a very large period, and the integral is the area. So it gets much bigger, even when you're in steady state with your proportional part. So you can imagine, at this point, the integral is smaller than at this point. And so the integral acts over a longer period of time to correct any like long-term offset. And you see that we do end up arriving at zero. Um, so you might ask, why don't we just use the integral term? Um, and in a sense, you could, because uh, as you're miles away, the integral just <coughs> gradually increase, and it will bring you towards zero. But it takes ages to start, because you have to allow it to build up this uh, error over time. And also, it's sort of, if you perform an integration, you sort of take yourself a phase change behind, so you become like 90 degrees slower than the way you want to be. And that just means that you're, all, you're, gonna, you're gonna overshoot more and you take longer to reach where you want to be. So at the moment, we've got a proportional and integral comp controller, but we've still got oscillation. We haven't dealt with the, pro the fact that we're at maximum velocity in the middle and we're going to shoot past. And this is what derivative does. So as, the deri as you shoot towards the point where you want to be, the derivative component note looks at your velocity in the astronaut example. And it notices that your velocity is really quite high. Um, and it acts as a, like a damping. So instead of going straight through, uh, as you get faster and faster, it adds a, a negative thrust that hopefully, if you've tuned everything right, will make you sort of coast onto your error equals zero. Um, and we can't use just the derivative, because if an astronaut was just floating with zero speed, um, we've got no proportional, no error, no integral term that's building up over time. Um, so our velocity would be zero. So if we're multiplying our integration, our ki, with zero, we get zero output of the controller. But clearly, we're miles away from where we want to be. Um, so here's just tabulating the effect of tuning these parameters. We're actually going to see more of these 
see, ex try and explain some of these effects in uh, the simulation. But uh, rise time is effectively the time it takes you to get to reach um, error equals zero for the first time. Uh, overshoot is you can imagine that you might be able to get there faster if you allow yourself to go to some degree of error over, over where you want to be. So the astronaut would go briefly above the height he wants to be and then quickly whap, whip, whip the thrust the other way and sort of land where he wants to be. Um, settling time, you can imagine, is how long it takes you to get to zero. Um, steady state error is uh, where I was talking about before, where you balance gravity. And without the integration term, you never reach zero. Um, and stability is, I already mentioned. And you can see that KP and KI uh, both degrade stability. Because you can imagine, if you made it really proportional, uh, then you're more likely to overshoot. Um, but the derivative, because it, help, because it helps you dampen yourself down, it doesn't have any effect on stability. Um, so how do we go about choosing these three magic values? Um, and quite often, in my case, it just comes by picking three that work. Um, but that doesn't work if you're building a really large system, because you often can't just try things out, because you've got that danger, like the bridge, that loads of engineers and whatever have built your super expensive project. And you can't just come along and just say, i equals 1, and then it all explodes. So there's a load of maths into like modeling your system, working out what these transfer functions are between each, each stage of that block diagram, um, and then using different models to try and work out. Mainly, you want to avoid stability, but avoid instability so that you can prove to yourself it's not going to blow up. So at least I can try this out and see how it works. Um, there's also some heuristic me methods such as this one, which just says p is the most important. That's, that's the one that basically gets us there. Um, so we'll start off by just in setting everything to 0 and keep increasing kp until we're oscillating. And we'll note down that time period and that kp that we needed. And then there's uh, a mathematical derivation that this gives you a reasonably good uh, set of values. Uh, so you take three-fifths of that value of kp, and then you perform these calculations as well. And the intuition behind this is that if you've got a really long period, you want more damping. So that's why d is proportional to t. And you want less integral term, because the integral is like lagging behind. So it's the most likely to cause you to overshoot. And the, the long period is because you've overshot. OK, so now, hopefully to liven everyone up, We've got a simulation. Um, so in this example, uh, this is a car. And it's trying to get to here, this flag. It's trying to stop on this flag. And we can control the force on the, on the car. Uh, so that's like pressing the acceleration pedal. Um, and we've got, against our what we want to do, we've got this wind uh, that's constantly pushing in this direction. And there's some resistive force as well. So it's quite similar to the astronaut example, except it's flat. Um, and so in this initial setup, with p is 0.125, i is 0, and d is 0, this is just happens to be exactly where it stays stable in this position, balanced with the wind. Um, and you can see this is a graph of error over time. Uh, this is the position where it wants to be, and this is where it's constantly sat at. Um, now, if we bring in a P-controller, uh, we'll see that it does exactly as it says. So it overshoots. Um, and then because of the resistive component, we lose uh, energy over time. And we do settle down to a steady state, but it's not the steady state we want. We settle down below where we want to be. As at this point, the force we're outputting is equal to the force of the wind. So when we introduce the integral controller, we hope that we'll see a similar shape, but it will be shifted up towards the to, over time. Uh, so we will actually end up in steady state where we want to be. Uh, 
Um, and you can see there's, that did happen, and there's a larger overshoot because both P and I are both increasing the kind of inertia you have at error equals zero. And now if we, instead of using PI, if we just use PD, so in this case, we're looking to end at the same position below where we want to be, but we want to do it without oscillating because we've got some damping. Which is pretty cool. Um, and then if we bring them all together, uh, we'll hopefully arrive at the flag, which is our aim. Um, and then that's one way we can get there, but we've still got this like three-dimensional space to explore of these parameters uh, to try and work out what's the best way. And, we, and particularly, we've got different ideas of what is the best way, because we might want to get to the flag, but whatever we do, do not go past the flag, in which case we'll have more damping and try and just sort of decay slowly onto it or we might be in a race and try and get to the flag as fast as possible. And then we might allow more overshoot and just hope that everything turns out all right. So this is a, an example of a better solution, in my opinion, but you might have a different opinion. Um, and then just for some fun, I've got an example of an unstable system, uh, and it's going to ruin the axes on my graph. Um, so the simulation isn't perfect because it's a finite difference simulation which makes a big assumption that the world updates exactly at the same time as the controller updates, uh, which obviously doesn't happen in the real world. Uh, so that leads to an interesting situation where if you set D to 1, uh, once it's reached the position it wants to be, uh, so the proportional term should be zero because we're at the position we want to be. The integral term should be zero because we're, in, we're stable at the position we want to be. And the derivative term is zero because we're stable at where we want to be. If we now introduce a step change, so we move the mouse, we move the position where we want to be instantaneously, uh, then at that update, we calculate the derivative. The derivative is the difference between the two points. And then if we multiply it by one, we end up, exactly updating our position, which is our acceleration, by, by the, the difference that we made. Uh, so we can see that. Or we can see A, hang on. Uh, we've just got to do a, a, a clear axis because we won't see anything otherwise. Um, so the tuned PID controller is close to uh, having d equals 1. And you can see it tracks pretty well. Um, but now if I bring in d equals 1, it basically is perfect, <laughs> which it's not as simple to tune these things in real life. Um, other things are that really, oh, and the main reason this isn't, simp isn't as trivial in real life is because you normally can't measure everything to perfect um, accuracy. And you're going to have noise in any signal. And noise inevitably means your derivative is really bad. Um, so you have to introduce some kind of averaging uh, to like a low pass filter. And once you do that, you're going to have some kind of lag. And that's not going to mean your world updates with like this finite different step. It also comes into where I said you don't have infinite acceleration. You can't just infinitely say now, sorry, infinite degree of change over your acceleration. OK, so controllers are the brains for an otherwise stupid system. They're the things that tell your car how to go at 70 miles an hour, not make your car go at 70 miles an hour. Um, and PID controllers are one way to do it. Um, they're not the best way, as in the most optimized for a specific solution but they are a really good way to have something working very quickly in all kinds of systems. Uh, and that's due to the fact that they've only got three parameters, uh, and they're so simple to build with a few electrical components, because integrators and differentiators 
for all standard stuff. Um, or they're quite simple to do in, I haven't actually got an example of the code, but this is the differential calculation. Uh, it's not exactly uh, 1A algorithms. Um, thank you. <laughs>